lovely to see you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we have a really interesting discussion for you. So for those who don't know, my name is Nigel Stewart. I'm the founder and director of an organization called the School of Pan-African Thought. Have you heard of us? Yeah. Wow, one clap. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it's hard work. Thank you very much. No, but we, uh, we're we an online school that teaches African and Pan-African studies. And I just want to say we're very proud to partner and be um, working with the Center of Pan-African Studies because these types of debates are really, really critical for public discourse. And I think when we started this journey, um, Daniel, Mikel, and I wanted to get to the existential question about what it means to be black, what black means to Pan-Africanism and, you know, how we can, you know, really try to bring solidarity from all our communities um, and move forward as one. So strap yourselves in. You're in for a very interesting debate. And uh, without further ado, I'm heading over to Mikhail Waldo. Thank you, Nigel, for the introduction. So my name is Mika Boldu. I am a postdoc research fellow here at SOAS within the Center of Pan-African Studies. Uh, welcome, everyone. So this is, uh, as Nigel mentioned, the first, uh, did you mention that we have a series of events? No. <laughs> so this is the first event uh, of a series of three where we really wanted to unpack um, a nuanced understanding of uh, the diaspora, the diaspora here in the UK, but also how it ties to uh, other global diasporas and the continent as well. So today is the first event. We really wanted to, you know, bring this lovely pan panelist who bring uh, different uh, areas of expertise and, and perspectives into discussion. So trying to move away, actually effectively moving away from a conversation that only focuses on uh, academia. Um, so we also had Lester, who is running late. By so, if you see someone coming and sitting next to us, you know our four panelists. Um, so, without further ado, I will pass on to my panel to the panelists um, to just give us two sentences to introduce yourself, and then we'll go into the conversation. I'll start with Queen. <clears throat> Okay, greetings, everyone. Greetings. Um, okay, well, my name's, uh, well, Brother Dr. Toyin Ekebetu, that's the full name, but Toyin is fine, Brother Toyin is fine. I am a Pan-Africanist. I am a scholar activist. I work as an anthropologist at University College London. Um, what do I do? I teach uh, decolonizing anthropology, nationalism, ethnicity and race, all the troublemaking topics, and uh, I look forward to reasoning with my wonderful panellists and yourselves. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> I also run a Pan African organization called Legality as well. Hi, I'm Aisha or Dr. Aisha Phoenix, and I'm a social justice lecturer at King's College London. And I'm also a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow, leading a research project on understanding colorism among young people in the UK. And many of you might know what colorism is, but for anyone who doesn't, I define colorism as, prejud as prejudice in which people are penalized the darker their skin is or the further their features are from those associated with whiteness. Hello, I'm Kelechi Okafor. Um, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so maybe we'll start with uh, Twin. Yes. Um, so I guess, so today, what we really wanted to unpack in this uh, conversation is to not only reflect on the current experiences of Black people in Britain, but also look at how um, things have shifted over the decades, right? So um, you started your career really kind of in, uh, in relation to grassroots organizing, so this has been really at the core of your work. And you will tell us more about Legali as well. And, and I wonder, and also you define yourself as a scholar activist. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what have you observed, particularly with your uh, community organizing, mm -hmm. uh, Pan-African community organizing? 
Well, I don't, I don't <laughs> think we have any time for all of that. Um, where do we start? Okay, so a scholar activist, just really I'm talking about the intersection between being a nerd, and I'm a nerd, I love my sci-fi, I love my comics, my vinyl, I'm a complete 100% nerd. Um, but I'm also an activist, I hate injustice. Um, and so I work quite hard to uh, challenge Afrophobia and, and kind of like anything that affects African people. I should say just from a, from a starting point, I don't use racializing language. So you won't hear me talk about black people, white people, yellow people, green people. You'll hear me talk about Africans, Europeans, Asian, Indian. I talk to people with respect, with their ethnicity. Doesn't mean that if you use those terms that I kind of like, you know, point my nose up to you, it's just something I can't do because of something what I know. So Legali started, that's the Pan-African organization that I ran, started what, around 20 odd years ago, looking at misrepresentation of African people and culture in the media. Uh, that's because I became a father and I noticed that my children were being affected by the images of what they were seeing in school, on posters, on soaps, dramas, radio stations, even comics. And so it was a really simple mission just to challenge those narratives. Um, I, I could talk about those things as questions come up later on. But what happened over the decades was that I realized that we had to move away from just challenging these misrepresentations of African history, culture and people to start in producing what we wanted to see because we kept on acting in a responsive kind of way. What happened, something would happen, we'd react. Something else would happen, we'd react. So, I mean, I remember dealing with EastEnders in the day, you know, when the represent now you see EastEnders and you see all these dramas and everything looks kind of diverse. It wasn't like that. You know, I'd be at, at home, somebody would be calling up from the BBC, hey, Toyin, there's going to be a program on BBC Two tonight. Right, 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 it's called The Trouble With Black Men. You need to deal with this, man. Get Legali to deal with it. And I'd be like, who's talking? They'd be like, you know what? Actually, you don't need to know my name. Just deal with it. And so we'd deal with it. We'd call in, the, the, you know, the, the executive producers. So it was that kind of focus initially. Um, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, and I'm not going to go through them all now, but what I will say is that I know there's a series called Defiance out right now, which is talking about the struggle of the South Asian community against racism. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm hearing good things about it. And this is in many ways, is kind of like um, the crux of why I'm a Pan-African as well, because I wear many hats like all of us do. So I'm a Pan-Africanist first and foremost, human rights centered, definitely. Um do I align myself with being politically black? Yes, I do. Am I black? Well, of course I'm not black. I mean, I'm brown. That's black. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, the racializing language. But I understand what we mean when we say black. As an anthropologist, I can't use racializing language. We're not talking about facts. This is white. I have never seen a person other than an albino who's that color. So when we're using these kind of color-coded terms, we're actually reaffirming this racializing language. So I've seen the shift. And the reason why I talked about defiance is because just yesterday, I remember on that platform called X by the, the musky boy, um, there was a, a, an image and it said something about how that, that act of defiance by the South Asian community was the birth of the British black community. And I just chuckled to myself. Well, no, because politically black at the time was a thing, because actually unity between African and Asian communities was strong. The, the OWAD Centre, it was, it was a real thing. What we see now with the madness in Parliament, where we see kind of like this illusion of, of, of inclusion, where you see diversity, which is actually toxic diversity, is what happened, which is why the Africanness, you know, why we separated but it doesn't mean that there's not those of us who actually like working together. So to talk about Pan-Africanism, we have to be specific. It's not black empowerment because black empowerment changes every five minutes. What's defined as black? Pan-Africanism is really about people of African heritage. And that goes back to the 15th century. That's talking about people from the Caribbean. It's talking about people from the continent. It's talking about people in the diaspora. It's a very rich topic. And so that's what my work has always been about. So I can talk, I can <laughs> And I mean, I have a, a follow-up question because you talk about, yes, I have a follow-up question because, you know, of course, uh, as the Center of Pan-African Studies, we also want to kind of reflect on what is the legacy of Pan-Africanism or the different iteration of Pan-Africanism and what does that mean in practice today, right? And so you you spoke about how language has shifted over time and, you know, what are some of, I guess, the benefits and limitations uh, of using racial language or not 
from from your perspective. But you know, Pan Africanism is, is also you know a solid like a movement of solidarity that's anti-imperialist and anti. So it kind of moves also beyond in some way. I think some there was a question from the audience uh, um, from the questionnaire was you know what does the, what does Pan African mean when you relate it to other uh, social justice movement? Is it only you know for Africans? from Africa, whether it's directly or indirectly? Pan-Africanism um, primarily benefits African people. But in doing that, in looking after the condition, the material conditions of African people, it benefits the entire world. It's really important to understand that. There's always been, there's a saying, I forget the quote exactly, it's something about you can tell this, the quality of the civilization by the way it treats its most vulnerable people. So even though right now I'm engaged in looking at the plight of Palestinians, for example, um, I have never lost sight of the fact of what African people experience continuously, even now during this, is still ongoing and there's complete silence on this. But Pan-Africanism has always been a global movement. It's always been a humanistic movement. Um, but again, it's, 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 it's the reason why language is so specific. So, you know, if we were all in here, we had a, a time machine, I pulled a lever down and we went back in time and moved to 50 year. 50 years ago, we'd be talking about, so I'd be saying, I'm a, I'm a lovely coloured guy and I'm very proud to be of my coloured roots. And that's what we'd be saying. If we hit a time machine and go, no, that's not enough, we pull it back again and whoosh. Okay, I'd be, now, Negro rights are the most important thing that we must be discussing, right? We keep going back, we go to the N-word, okay? These terms shift because they're not our terms. We didn't define them. No African would define the N-word. It's impossible. It dehumanizes us. We don't. So those terms we've inherited the reason why I'm a Pan-Africanist, the reason why language matters so much, if we take a side that some of the greatest scholars in our history, from the Malcolms, you know, from the John Henry Clarks, I mean, some of the greatest scholars have said that we're Africans, and we're just dismissing that when we ignore that. It's just the simple things. Right now, there's this, there's this, this tend to talk about anti-blackness, you know, this anti-black thing. And I get it. And so I don't like to be pedantic because I'm from a generation of Pan-Africanists that sometimes can be a bit overzealous with the policing. You know, the whole tips, I'm a whole, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's really irritating. I sign off everything with peace, which means hotep. And, 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 I can, and I do wear traditional clothes and I do have glasses. I don't wear an anorak, but I am a traditional Pan-Africanist. But anti-blackness is not the same thing as Afrophobia. Afrophobia is a specific term. It's been ratified by the European Union because the UK is outside of the European Union now. So we don't have the protections. And it's a specific piece of legislation that protects people of African heritage. But yet in the UK, we, we go back to using anti-blackness, which means that we don't have any protection. And it's because we think we're being radical, right? We're watching things like the Black Lives Matter movement, and we're not questioning things like what grew from that, the response of the ADOS movement, which is the Americans of, of uh, what's it, the Americans of slavery. What, what about the, the, the FBA, foundational Black Americans? These are African people who are denying their African ancestry, one root in their story, their legacy, to slavery, which is badness. And the others are eradicating the history of Amerindians. They're saying that they were there before the Amerindians. So this confusion comes about when you take on other people's ideology. We have enough scholars, we have enough literature, we have enough historians to tell us that we are Africans with different shades, different roots, you know, expressions of different culture. So that's kind of like why I'm very firm about language. I hear that. What comes out from everything that you just shared is also not only who defines blackness right but also who gets excluded yeah. uh, and so who gets to find to define within us within kind of the the africans the black community whatever terminology you want to use who is included and who is not and i wanted to touch on uh aisha on your research on colorism and whether you found i mean what are some of your findings because obviously it's one of the first i think it's one of the first research looking at colorism in the UK specifically, uh, in terms of who gets to define um, who is included in this Black narrative. Thank you. So that's something that's come up quite a lot in different projects that I've, I've re different research projects that I've been involved with looking at colorism in the UK, is this contestation around blackness and who gets to be included within the boundaries of blackness. And so we've had participants who've got one white parent and one black parent who 
define themselves as black and who might live in a rural area and be read as black by by white racist people around them. So their experiences are of vile racism. They're read as black people. But when they then come and encounter black groups that define themselves as black, they say, oh, well, you don't, you don't fit here. Why are you here? You don't belong. And that that's really painful because there's this juxtaposition between their experiences and then how they're treated in those, in those other groups. And so that's something that we've explored quite a lot with different participants. And it's very painful. And I think colorism, because of the way in which it pits people of different skin shades against each other, including black people, it has a very detrimental impact on that ability to to kind of work with people and, and recognise and respect others. Because if you feel that you're being treated badly because your skin's dark and you're, you've had experiences at school, which we've we've had repeated in, in the research we've done, of being called blick or me, having jokes made about the lights go out, or oh, we can't see you and it's really funny, and oh, it's just banter, but it's not just banter for you. The impact of that then can lead to distrust, resentment of people with light skin who you feel are getting unjustified privilege, and it goes both ways. And that is, that's very damaging. Mm. And I remember, because just before we started, we were having a little bit of a conversation on this. And because it, it's, it's also, uh, I mean, this is something that I found, for example, uh, in my current research project, where I'm looking at how um, second generation of African descent in the UK, so the children of African migrants in the UK, navigate their multiple identities. So some, and, and I'm looking specifically at people who are, um, you know, of Eritrean, Ethiopian, Nigerian, and Ghanaian heritage. And so one thing that, I were, uh, you know, somebody of um, Eritrean descent shared with me was, you know, growing up, she, was, she did not, it was basically most of the discrimination that she received was from other black kids because she did not uh, present as black in the way they was constructed at the time where she was growing up. Mm -hmm. Things have changed now, right? But again, uh, at the time, it, it, of course, there is an element of colorings, but also, you, you become the, the I think you, you wrote something in your paper, the perpetrator and also the, the victim. So it's, it's not it's clear, uh, clearly defined, right? You don't only play a role. I don't know if you had any other reflection on this. Um, if it so, came up in your research as well. So in terms of in terms of that both being being subjected to colorism and perpetrating it, that did come up quite a lot. And what was really interesting was when you're talking to so we did research with students in years eight and nine, so they're thirteen, I think thirteen, fourteen, and then in sixth form, who was seventeen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. And what they were saying was predominantly the people making with most banter were black young men and they were black young men with medium skin tones light skin tones dark skin themselves making jokes about other people with dark skin and sometimes it was young women as well but it was very sometimes you felt like it was a preemptive strike so if I say something really bad about your skin shade everyone will laugh at you not me mm -hmm. so there was that and other times it was people with lighter skin who felt <laughs> exempt from this because they weren't going to be subjected to colorism having uh, jokes at the expense of someone else um so it was, it was very very painful and although students characterized it as banter. I did one interview with one young man who was saying, he said he described himself as the black Frankenstein. He said, I'm the darkest person you'll ever see. I'm, you know, I'm like Frankenstein. People cross the road when they see me because I mean, I must look really frightening. And it, he'd really internalized these negative, these negative um, uh, racist, colorist um, statements that people made about him. But then I had a focus group with him and his friends. And what was really interesting then was that they were like, oh, it's just banter. It doesn't matter. And I'm <laughs> I'm there trying not to look at him, but knowing that he did not just see it as banter. But his friends were like, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, they were all black young men in this focus group. But they they didn't understand the impact. And I was trying to trying to explore it, trying to tease it out in that room without saying your friend doesn't think it's just banter. Mm. Um, so so that's that's one thing in relation to that. And it was interesting what you were saying then about um the Eritrean, Eritrean young person who wasn't who wasn't defined as black. Mm. Um, when I did research quite a few, it must be 15 years ago, I think, with young Somali young people. I it was young, they were sixth formers and they were young women. And they were saying, um, one of them was like, Am I black? I don't know. And others were like, Oh, we're not black. And they're not, they weren't being seen as black, and they weren't being read as black at the time. And so that was that was really interesting. Thinking about thinking as you as you raised the question of the boundaries of blackness, it's very much contested. And as as you were saying, it shifts and changes over time. So who's included in, in one decade will not necessarily be included in another decade. And you, you raised the question, the, the topic of political blackness. That's changing and how how that's seen the kind of 
the um, appreciation for the, the idea of political blackness, where people are grouped with different racialized backgrounds are grouped together and under this kind of this umbrella to challenge racism isn't as popular now as it was decades ago. And and so I think it's, it's really important to look at the shifts and the positioning and how that changes. Mm -hmm. And did you want to? Yeah, I mean, just on the exclusion point, I mean, the, the, the two things, I mean, actually, the, the colorism issue, um, it's really interesting. I did a, I made a documentary some years ago called Beauty Years, which dealt with this issue um, from a pan African perspective. And I remember talking to a friend of mine, his artist, uh, a, a, a target, and we were chatting about why we perpetrate some of these issues amongst ourselves. And he, he said something that always stayed with me. He talked about African people not inherently, those African people, or many of us, not believing that we're beautiful. It reminded me of Dr. Clark's test, where we don't think of ourselves, we don't have that self-worth. Because he explains, if you start looking at the crime that we commit against ourselves, take out all the economic factors, there's also this issue about beauty. You cannot destroy something that you find beautiful. It's very difficult to do that. If you find something that's intrinsically beautiful, you kind of want to protect it, you want to preserve it. You don't want to destroy it. And because we're socialized in a way to see blackness as dirty, and Malcolm gave all the examples of all the, you know, all the synergies that come in the words that, that, that blackness is supposed to represent, what happens is that therefore it's easy to attack each other. So that's, I mean, that's one thing on the beauty issue. So the colorism is a real issue. The banter thing also is like triggering because I remember the Metropolitan Police, when we kept on hearing the issues about why is there institutional racism, even though the current head doesn't agree with that, one of the things I used to say, it was banter in the canteen. Well, we know that banter has serious impacts on us. It has serious violent impacts on us. So you're right about the banter, not just on our level, but also in the institutional level. It's never just banter. But on the exclusion, it ties into it because, you know, I'm not going to say I'm ashamed of, but it's something I had to acknowledge. I was raised in the culture of man-Africanism. And I say man-Africanism as opposed to pan-Africanism because when I was learning my 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 you know you know my my business on the streets of of, of London as a pan-Africanist, all the scholars, all the role models, everyone came through from a male perspective. And I'm not ashamed of some of those, but the exclusion of women from that movement was quite disgusting, and that has had some serious consequences because what it means is that we exclude on. On, on, the, on the basis of colorism, we exclude on the basis of gender, and the, the, the odd one is that we ex, we explain on we exclude on the issue of geographical called colonizers. And what I mean is that my wife is from Saint Lucia, so you know what happens is that Saint Lucia is quite funny because it had the English as colonizers for one moment, and then the French as another, and so we kind of like it's you know they they're just against you know those who are Pan Africans who are there are against all colonizers. But if you are coming from West Africa, you tend to be more Anglophone in your way of thinking about who the racist is, who the enemy is. If you come from somewhere like Senegal, is one of my favorite places to be, you tend to be very Francophone about it. And so we have these exclusionary patterns about who's the problem. And that works against us because it means we also link with those from those particular regions who speak the same language as the colonizers. And so Eritreans are excluded. The whole of East Africa is often excluded from the discourse about Pan-Africanism as if they didn't have any contribution to be made from it. And so this is something else mm. when it comes to exclusion that we have to. Ethiopia. And, and the, the legacy we see, if you go to somewhere like Bristol, you'll find that the Somali community, for example, or African just like you and I, are treated as if they're somehow different. They're not black enough. Mm. When if you look at the history of black politics, and I mean black in its sense that was given to us the irish were once rendered black they were seen as black and then what happened they went to america they started oppressing african americans and so they earned their whiteness stripes and they become part of team whiteness mm -hmm. and so they no longer were black so these boundaries of, of racialization continuously shift dependent on who is convenient to what power dynamics in place we haven't got time for those games we observe them, study them, acknowledge them, but we need as a family to recognise that we're African or of African heritage, and that's really where it starts from. Can let you. One thing that I've noticed, um, you know, um, across your work, whether it be you know the podcast, your writing, um, your, your social media uh, presence is that often you're one of the people, there are few people that really kind of talks about an inclusive 
movement, but also practice it, right? Even with the um, with the pole dance studio, right? Because how do we, so inclusion and exclusion doesn't only happen across, you know, where the where heritage and history of colonial has happened. Uh, you mentioned gender, but also, you know, uh, that there is definitely class, gender identity and sexuality. And many speak on this, but not, not as many practice it. So why do you think it's so important to, you know, speak, not only speak, but really move from the, pl the place of no one is free until we're all free? Um, I feel like it's, it's a, it's a journey, isn't it? It's a journey that we're all on and I've been forced on the journey to let go of labels. So I don't ascribe any label, label to myself. I wouldn't call myself an activist, for instance, because when people have called me that, other people have jumped up and gone, she's not an activist because she has a life. So like, so, <laughs> so, so like, okay, fine. I'm not an activist then like there's always a reason right and I just think to myself okay beyond the label what are you doing like what are you doing do people feel safe around you and some people that I encounter have the most esteemed titles and labels but they're very harmful in their immediate environment yet they'll get every accolade under the sun and all the institutional respect but for me it's just like I just I just want to I just want to be cool with everybody, as many people as I can be cool with. And so I can't, I see beyond gender. So if somebody says to me, these are my pronouns, for instance, who the hell am I to bring out the dictionary and go, wow, <laughs> if we're looking at plurality, like what, what, what does that, I don't care. You know, it's all about being able to see the person because so many of us know what it feels like to be unseen. And when you're not seen, then atrocities can be committed against you and you're forgotten in history, like you're just forgotten. So to me, movements that historically leave out women, for instance, leave out femme identifying people, leave out queer people, they're not my movements because there, there can't be any political stance that says that these people are worth leaving behind and then we think that that's a just political stance to take. If we're not all coming, then I'm not going as far as I'm concerned. That's it. And this is really important. So we recently had um, a lecture by Professor Hakim Adi, you know, <laughs> we had the, the launch of our center. And, you know, and one of the things that came up from his lectures that many speak of our forefathers of the Pan-African movement, but we don't hear as much of the foremothers, right? And then, as you said, what about all the other people <laughs> who uh, who have contributed to this movement, but we don't hear about it? The, the, the voices are not recorded. We don't learn about it in the classroom, in the discussion. They're not in the room, right? Again, it goes into this conversation about who gets to define the, those experiences and uh, who is left behind, who is who are on the margins, right? Um, Welcome. <laughs> no, thank you for joining us. Um, I guess I wanted to, uh, you know, we've been having a conversation on how things have shifted over time for Black people in Britain. And I wanted to uh, ask you a bit something about voice, the voice, right? So as somebody who didn't grow up in the UK, so I had to do the research. So, okay, this is an important newspaper that, you know, came to exist for a specific reason that are needed. Uh, they were needed then, but now, you know, continue to be needed. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your time at The Voice. As, uh, you, had, you, you were there different times, right? Yes, that's right, yeah. yes. So um, what have you noticed for, through your work and how have things shifted from, you know, when you first joined to when you joined again, I think in the 2000s? Um, and also maybe a little bit about the voice for those who are not familiar with the newspaper. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, apologies for being late. Um, the, the voice is is now and has been for a few years uh, the the only black uh, a national uh, newspaper uh, in the UK, which uh, I think says something about uh, the state uh, of uh, black media, or certainly the legacy uh, black media anyway, or got a lot more uh, new new media coming uh, coming on board. Um, before I get to the voice, I think it's just worth noting that, you know, that, that was not the first 
uh, black newspaper. Uh, there were others, um, you know, West Indian Worlds, um, yeah, launched by uh, by Claudia Jones, um, and uh, you had the Caribbean Times as well, which uh, Arif Ari, uh, Ali uh, led, uh, and those uh, New Nation um, as well, which uh, closed in two thousand and nine, um, and uh, and those papers uh, were. Uh, uh, black newspapers, which were um, unapologetically um, pan-African uh, to a large extent, uh, and uh, certainly um, very, very cognizant of uh, anti-colonial uh, uh, narratives as well. Um, so uh, that, that, in a way, is the you know some of the some of the history uh, behind the Voice. The Voice was set up uh, in as a re- reaction uh, to the uh, 1981 um, uprising uh, in in Brixton, but it happened um, across the UK um, as well. Uh, and it started as as a radical paper, um, kind of lost its way uh, a little bit, uh, and is on a very very slow path i think to try to get it back whether it's too late or not obviously is another uh, is another question uh, altogether um in terms of um the uh, the voices approach to uh to pan africanism and and identity uh obviously it's a big question uh, it certainly hasn't been an obstacle um but uh hasn't been the the greatest champion uh certainly over the last two years um uh, when i was there we did a, a lot of uh, articles about reparations um, which is kind of pan Africanism in a way, um, uh, and in in some ways a, a good vehicle because uh, you know to talk about identity as well, um, because you know it's it really is about that that sort of reawakening uh, to a certain extent, um, uh, not just amongst the the wider uh, black community, but actually amongst other communities um, too. So you know challenging. Uh, challenging history um, and and challenging the um, yeah uh, just you know the, the foundation on which this country was uh, was 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 built if you like but I think there's a long long way to go because there hasn't been much polling hasn't been much research done on public opinions uh, to do with reparations so I'm segueing a little bit away from the question um, but uh, the little that has been done has actually shown that uh, um, uh, just only slightly over half uh, of all black people polled um, were in favour. Of, of reparations, so there's there's a big big uh, way to to go uh, of that. I think the voice has a as a responsibility to um, uh, try and fight back against that, but it can't can't do that um, alone. And it's really up against the the media uh, landscape that we have. That you know we can't deny the fact that uh, uh, we live in a you know we all, well, we've always lived in a hostile environment, but you know in some ways it's actually getting more hostile, and it has been uh, for the last few years, and it looks like it's going to continue um as well so so that's that's the battleground um i think uh but uh, there's there's a long way to go yeah um i also wanted to um ask about your work within the trade union i think you were part of the task force uh anti for the anti-racism work and i specifically asked this um as a reflection to you know the history that the pan-african movement has had with unions over the years right and thinking about spaces that are meant to be the you know to safeguard all their members yeah. and yet you know like people within those spaces are not necessarily safeguarding the same way historically right yeah, I don't know. Like, completely sound uh, negative with my every answer, but uh, the unions are not as political as they used to be. Um, they uh, that's coincided with the, them losing half their members <laughs> since uh, in the last twenty years. Uh, but it, you know, in the past, they used to be involved in anti-racist groups like Anti-Racist Alliance. Um, th- th- they used to be funded by trade unions. Uh, they, they, you know, trade unions were uh, unapologetic. Uh, or they used to be uh, about standing up for refugees, um, standing up for uh, for all oppressed um, communities, and being uh, more sort of you know race conscious than than they um, are today. Uh, some of the big ones, I think, have become sort of mini kind of corporations in a way in terms of the way of of, uh, of, of thinking. It's about servicing the members with services as opposed to uh, to actually fighting uh, for uh, their their rights. Um, so uh, the yeah the, the trade union congress uh, I was part of it uh, had an initiative called the anti racism task force uh, which was uh, led by um, Patrick Roach who's one of only three uh, black trade union leaders um, and and it was basically like herding cats uh, because 
uh, the by and large, I think there's there's a real reluctance within the trade union movement uh, to, uh, to 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 organise amongst black communities, uh, quite frankly, which is which is kind of crazy. Uh, and if you look at where the real gaps are in in trade union membership, it's in the private sector, uh, in in particularly in the parts of the private sector where you have a very high uh, black workforce. So it doesn't make any sense, like not to not to do that um, at all, really. Um, but um, you know. I guess we are where we are. I think the trade union movement overall uh, has been sort of intimidated, really, by anti-trade union legislation. We've had lots of it um, uh, over the the last uh, sort of you know forty years, um, not just from the Tories actually. Um, so uh, you know, there's there's confidence I think has sapped. Uh, from the trade union movement, uh, and there's sort of like a reluctance to get involved in things which are sort of you know seen as outside the workplace. But actually, anti-racism uh, or you know tackling racism in the workplace is actually not outside the workplace at all. They could do a lot better, and there's a lot more things that trade unions can do. And we were trying to push and uh, put them on the table uh, because we know that you know at root to uh, a lot of the racial disparities that we see in housing and health uh, and other areas is actually caused by you know economics is caused by the amount of money in your pocket and the barriers uh, to uh, to entering work to progressing in work um, and you know um, uh, you know the issues to do with discipline uh, and uh, and stuff like that uh, so you know we the, Tackling workplace racism is so important, and you know, trade unions uh, in certain places have uh, what's called sectoral collective uh, bargaining agreements, uh, where they tend to sort of talk about health and safety and uh, and pay. But actually, why can't they be bargaining uh, for race equality? You know, pushing those employers and actually getting. Uh, getting uh, agreements or signed in blood uh, from the bosses uh, to actually say, and so both the trade unions and the uh, work uh, and the employers own this agreement, which actually says, you know, these are our targets, this is what we're going to do, this is our action plan. Um, And and that's what they can do. But actually, it's not happening at the moment. I don't know what we can do um, to try and um, change it other than join uh, trade unions. But sometimes even that, uh, you know, is is fine up to a point. But then when you're actually getting to senior levels and challenging for those high positions, then you have uh, big, big uh, problems. Uh, and, and I'm on a little bit of a rant here. But actually, um, when you uh, look at the uh, recent um, uh, um, contests for general secretary, Okay, so uh, um, Unison is the biggest trade union, um, and um, uh, you know, a good friend of mine for many, many years, uh, Roger McKenzie, uh, went. He was a deputy uh, general secretary for quite a while. Went for the top job, lost out um, to you know Christine McKenay, and then was actually effectively uh, kicked out. Uh, a GMB. Uh, you had you had an Asian um, uh, sister who was. Chal- was again deputy challenged for the top job lost out and then was was pushed out so if you're pushed out at the moment when you lose out then how 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 is that a going to encourage anybody to actually go for the top job um and you know and 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 b what sort of signal does it send to to uh, people who you know join trade unions and feel so passionate about workers rights that they actually really want to progress in that in that organization so so lo- long long way to go and you know it is a disappointing picture at the moment yeah yeah. I want us to um so I, I want us to think about kind of the different tools and means uh, through which we can you know approach social justice. Um you know with with legally you use um films as well education also the arts so the role of the arts which I think uh, is something that is often missing in discussion, particularly within the academic spaces, but also uh, in the activist, whatever that means, space, right? And really, the arts are often the tools that help to kind of democratize this knowledge and really allows everybody to engage with this uh, with this information and knowledge, and then go off to you know, um, I guess, apply it in their day to day lives. Um, I'll let you on come to you. <laughs> and with your uh with your book, I mm-hmm. look here, your collection of um your anthology. Um what struck me, you know, when I was reading the book is that you're almost inviting us to imagine 
So it, it relates to realities that are really present. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really rea uh, connected to our uh, reality, but collectively, but also imagining alternative futures. Mm -hmm. And so it feels to me, and this is not only with your book, but also in your other work, that you really encourage us to imagine a world where, you know, as you said, everybody is free, but also it's a movement that is inclusive. Mm. Right. So why do you think it's important to use the arts? It's, you know, all, all the different means that you use to communicate this message. And, you know, do you think that this is more powerful or what's, what's the benefit about adopting this strategy? Yes. Um, I feel like any tools that we have, we should use them, you know, um, I didn't always consider myself to be a writer. It was only when I was approached around 2020. I mean, I'd always been tweeting, you know, I stay tweeting. But <laughs> um, I, was, I, I didn't consider myself to be a writer until one of my friends, she DM'd me one day on Twitter or X, whatever Elon's calling it. And she said, you really need to stop writing for free. And I was like, huh? Nah. She was like, but you're you're writing threads, girl. Like they can make a whole garment, like you're writing. And so people take your words and then they go and get commissioned to write the pieces. So be more serious about your thoughts as you're writing them. And so she helped me to kind of shift my perspective on what I was sharing. Because before I would see my tweets end up in an article and I'd be like, ah, like, that's so cute. Not realizing that my work has been mined. Um and so she was, she helped me shift uh, my perspective and she actually introduced me to the um, person that got me to write my first article. And then I was writing more and more and I really started to think, yeah, I've got things to say. Um, there's a particular mode or way that I might speak on social media, but it's not necessarily the way that I write. And it's not the way that I go onto the news, for instance, to speak. Um, you have to be able to switch it up and all my life, I just thought I was just going to be an actress. When I was younger, I just thought, oh, I'm going to be an actress, not realizing that the same skills that one would use in terms of acting, I was meant to use in another way. Um, and that creativity. And so I feel like the problem, one of the problems that we face, a major problem that we face in our society is that upon everything else, our imagination is under attack. And that's, that's to me, the issue, the fact that we can't, when you say to somebody, like, imagine a world different to the one you're living now, a lot of people can't do it. They, they literally cannot visualize something else other than this because we've been conditioned to believe, well, this is the only way it can be. And then we had lockdown and then some things, policies that we were told were hard and fast were changing overnight. So that really got me to start thinking about how we're played with and how, how how our mind is played with. And if our minds are colonized, then we're just going to go along with whatever it is that we're told. And I know um, I say this, um, I've said this quite a few times, but Shakespeare was talking about something else, right? When he said, um, allegedly, to sleep per chance to dream, right? He's talking about something else, but I'm going to take that literally, like to sleep for you to have a chance to dream, right? But then I think about the ways in which we've had to work, our parents and our, like how they've had to work. If you're tired, you don't have time to dream. You can, you don't even get time to sleep. So if mm. I can't dream, when you tell me about liberation, what are you talking about? Because I, I don't have the mental capacity currently to envision what that looks like. You know, so that's why we've got people like, um, you know, organizations like the MAP, um, NAP ministry, when we are, actively seeking rest um I went to watch a play maybe some of you can help me I've forgotten the name um at the it was at Stratford and it was a minstrel show oh yeah and they you they realized that they're in a minstrel show and there was just one character Tambo and Bones Same. yes thank you and um one of them just really wanted to sleep his whole like arc in that move, movie in that play was that he wanted to sleep and I feel like that went over a lot of people's heads that he wants to rest a lot of us wants to rest but we're not given the chance to do so and it's not just the rest in order to physically rest our bodies there needs to be a state that our mind goes into in order for us to access our creativity and we're not being allowed it so edge of here is an exercise for me in trying to encourage that. I mean, so many incredible writers have come before me. I'm not like, you know, reinventing the wheel or anything, but just imagining what would it be like if we're looking at the um, technology and how as Black people we're interacting with technology, what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for us in terms of love? Because sometimes when we're looking at movements 
political movements, it's like we get sh- like shy about speaking about love. We get shy about speaking about spirituality. If we put spirituality to the side, if you're not doing the thing for love, why? What, what's the point then? What, where are we headed to if not to be able to um, embody love truly, honestly, deeply and express that and experience that with each other? What are we doing then? I don't want to go somewhere where it's just all about like, oh, just general economic freedom. That doesn't mean anything to me. So I can buy five Nikes. Wonderful. Um, like, you know, it's 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 I wanted to try a different mode of having conversations with people and also um like also on a strategic level some people might not watch my videos because colorism right so they see this person that's speaking um might not be speaking in rp you know i'm using very colorful language so they might not take in what i'm saying in fact they might call it a rant and i don't ever think that i'm ranting i'm making points you know so they might take it a particular way i still need to get in your house so how am i going to get in your house well if i write a book i have more of a chance of getting into your house and then once i make it into your home then to me we're near the end game because my is now my 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 imagination I see are possibly looking is now in your home and it's not so easy to switch me off you if you think about it right and so there are some people in the book that might not necessarily know anything of social media might not know about the dance studio or any of that they won't know about the children's home i built um Nigeria all of these things doing to me a single prong I experienced certain things when I was a child. Also, I think about to London. I came to England when I was five from Nigeria. I was born in Nigeria. And I often think about what would my life have been had I stayed in Nigeria. We weren't well off, right? You know, we were just living in Mushi. So I, we weren't well off, right? So I don't know what life would have been like for me. And so if I have the chance to, why wouldn't I want life to be better for you know, children right now who are out there that I can possibly positively influence the trajectory mm. of their life. And it's not just those children. I'm thinking about the ways that we're captured in images or um, African women, Nigerian women are captured in images and it's just shared across the world that they're sitting in their, in their marketplaces. Some of us as the diaspora will go and have a freaking photo shoot in the marketplace using our own people as like a backdrop that's meant to look exotic or something. And it's like, we don't even take in who we're around. Mm. We're, we're, we're interacting with our heritage from the colonialist lens. So my case study is that, all right, I'm going to build a resource center or I have built a resource center. I still need to kit it out in Nigeria. If I make it so that these women in this area that have their little market stores, they're probably selling Indomie or they're selling SIM cards or whatever the case may be, they're doing these things. And I give them access to the network that I've built over the years of being an influencer, knowing some super incredible academics and just wonderful people who are going to run courses for me via the internet that these people don't have to pay anything for, but they can come and sit there also get some resources as well, nappies, whatever the case may be. They get to come into this place. They take in all of this knowledge. I wonder what life will then be like for them in like 10, 15 years. And then what are we doing in terms of changing that area? And the specific area that I built the children's home in, um, there was in 2006, I believe, there was a massive explosion there because the oil, you know, shell, all of them lot, their oil pipe ran through that area. And I think people were trying to tap the oil pipe in that area and it caused a massive, so everything got taken to the ground. So many people died and they've only started what, you know, in recent years, rebuilding themselves in that area. And so I didn't even know at the time. So it wasn't like me being super cute. I didn't know until, you know, we got the land and I started working and I realized what had happened there. And I feel that there is something there about even like reclaiming, thank you, even us like reclaiming our, world like our story because these conglomerates and corporations can come in and just interfere with our life and because of the socioeconomic spaces that we find ourselves in or experiences that we find ourselves in we do things that might be risky and then end up getting hurt for it so 
any mode that I have, whether it's the pole dance studio to ex- encourage people to explore their sensuality more, because we talk about the power of the erotic, you know, and how we all create from an erotic space, whether we want to realize that or not, the pole dance is doing that thing. My social commentary is doing that thing because I want to be a black woman sharing my opinions and nobody's going to tell me to not share those opinions. The book is doing its own thing because I'm hopefully encouraging us to imagine something different because curiosity and imagination is the beginning, I feel, of our liberation. So that's going on. And then I've got the children's home as something that I don't know lots about in terms of how I'm running it, but I know that I'm smart enough that I know lots of smart people and lots of people who are dedicated to the work. So they'll help me and my mum to figure it out. So for me, it's just like anything I've got, it's just all, you know, all the barrels, like let's go, whatever Mm -hmm. it takes. Um, Because it is psychological warfare. It is constant trauma that we are engaging with. And if some of us have the mental capacity to do so, we have to use everything that we've got, um, you know, to to try to kind of push back on that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm conscious of time because it's uh, seven and I know that you probably have questions. Do you have questions? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the mics, yes. Where are the mics? Maybe be- while we wait for the mics to be ready. Um, you mentioned an important point that we haven't discussed today as much, uh, particularly the relationship between the diaspora and the continent, right? So as people who are having those conversations within the diaspora, what does it mean for us to engage uh, with Africa in a way that it doesn't replicate some of the really problematic dynamic that uh, already exists uh, and in a way that is ethical, right? Where, we, as you said, we just so happened, like myself, I was born and raised in Italy and I'm now here in the UK because I have an Italian passport, right? So we just so happened to be in this place and, we, and it could have been very different. So what does that mean for us? Uh, and I, I guess this is open to, to the whole panel. What does it mean for us to engage ethically with the continent in a way that um, you know, doesn't replicate those problematic dynamics? Um, that's a really important question. It's a really good one. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm part of a discipline that was involved in the colonization of our motherland. I work in it. I'm an anthropologist, and I even hate saying that. Um, well, that's why I teach decolonizing anthropology. But even then, there are limits, and um, it's important to say that. It's important to recognize that because I, I tend to think, and uh, Sister Kalitu, she's very. What you said about imagination is so critical because I think that we engage in spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. I think that our minds are being colonized. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to working with the mother, when it works working with the continent, I actually don't believe that we ourselves are the ones to do that work. Mm-hmm. I think our responsibility, I don't think you're just here by accident. That's another thing. Mm-hmm. So I think whatever the ancestors plan was for you, you're here for a certain reason. Mm-hmm. And you might not know it, but your, you know, your job is, I think Fanon talks about either betray the mission or you realize it. So you're working to realize it. So the mission for us really who are here in the diaspora is to understand the climate, to understand our enemy, to understand our systems, to see the opportunities, not to go back and recolonize uh, the motherland. I hear a lot of times of people leaving from the diaspora saying, I'm going to go back to Africa and I'm going to teach them how to do this and all. With this silly under- misunderstanding that a continent of over a billion people that you want somehow know something more than them. It's kind of like how the Western democratic systems work, where you've got these two kind of like, and I'm not an ageist, but you've got these two old men in America and the people are just accepting that they are the best choices Mm. out of all of them, yeah? This is how we sometimes go back. If we think about the history of Liberia and we think about it was the American colonization, um, what's the organization that, that started that process? We often go back to the motherland 
with this colonized mindset, I, I, you know, I know that that's dangerous. I know that we can reinscribe those problems. When we go in there and we have our money and our money has this, this artificial, uh, uh, like a uh, value that's mm. over anything. It's like we are actually engaged sometimes in enslavement. We don't see it that way. But if you're giving someone like 50 pounds to do a, a year's work of work, then you're enslaving them. You don't see it that way. You rationalize it differently. It doesn't mean that we don't have any role. The role that we have is actually to seek out those who are doing the work and then to use our resources, our expertise and our connections and our relationships to empower them to do better. I remember when I, I did some work in Ghana, a place called Aquitaine, and we have a lot of Pan-Africanists across the continent, despite what the media tells us about the, the flies and, and, and the bellies and all that kind of nonsense. We have a lot of Pan-Africanists. And I remember I was working in the hospital, just building up the their, their, their IT system for them. And um, I remember we were sitting down with a few who ran the hospital. And the brother said to me, Patrick, I remember he said, Toyin, you know, I'm a Pan-Africanist like you, but what do I do? I run this hospital and 90% of our medicines come from the West. We want to be able to develop those medicines inside. So they, 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 they kind of like made the structures look in a certain way that they were therapeutic for our mental health abilities. But when it came down to those core decisions, they were still importing the nonsense. And so that's our role. Our role is to find out how do you break these IP patterns that this all these kind of nonsense. How do you how do you get the journals and actually find the information to bring in new classes, the, the training courses, for example? How do you do those kind of things? That's the work, not to kind of like get caught up in this L'Oreal approach. I am worth it. I am the one. I am. I, I am. You know. <laughs> yeah. No. We're part of a long train, a long destiny of ancestors who brought us to this particular point right now. And we're either going to realize the mission or we're going to betray the mission. And if we're going to realize it, then that means, okay, it's a lifelong uh, mission. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we're going to be coaching while we're recharging. And that's okay. It's lifelong. It's, like, it's not a five-minute process. But when we're ready, then we find those allies. We build those relationships. We find those resources. I call myself as an activist, but I'm very shy. I'm a musician at heart. You know? I'm, you know, that's, I started off as a musician, right? So this whole thing about art is important. But what's happened is that I'm a nerd. Whether I like it or not, I can read those journals and I get it. I understand it. I put holes in their policies. It's like I asked my wife to read an article and she's kind of like, mm, she's got your book by the side of our bed. <laughs> you know I mean, I'm looking at she's going through it. She won't read anything I write, you know what I mean? So I'm realizing, <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? We've all, there's, there's a, a beautiful El Duncan tune. Every man does his way a little thing differently. It's a perfect tune. And we have to know who we are, what we are, what is our strength, where, where do we fit in and not beat ourselves over the stick if we can't do things the same way everyone else did. Look at the Black Panther movement. Look at the way they used art, the way they, they, they had their 10-point program to make sure they could communicate with everyone. They had scholars. They had, you know, they had activists. They had men with guns. They had women who were doing breakfast clubs. They had women who were strategists. They had the whole thing. So I think when we talk about diaspora, sorry for the long run, <laughs> and it is a run, I know. <laughs> Thank you. But, but the reality of the situation is that, you know, we have to recognise that it's a complex situation and that we, the fact that we're talking in English and you understand me in English, I mean, there's something I do with my students. I'm going to ask you right now, just like, those of you who dream in English, can you put your hands up, please? How many of you dream in English? Can you put your hands up? As one of the languages, not the other. Okay, no, 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 I want to invert it. How many of you do not dream in English? Okay, look at that, right? So this, this, when your dreams are colonized, when you're using the language, the colonial traps of, you know, it's got words in there and concepts and ideas and framing your aspirations in that language, we have to recognize that we have a problem. It's why, it's why Ngugi uh, uh, made that massive decision to transfer his books. It's the reason why Usman Semben decided, he's another perfect example. He's an amazing novelist. We got bits of wood, amazing novelist, but he had to start making films because he couldn't talk to his people through the films. He couldn't reach enough through the books. He couldn't reach enough. They couldn't afford the books. So he made films. So we have to recognize that we, our minds, as much as we are dealing with this liberatory journey, it's a lifelong process. It takes time to get there. And so support those who are on the ground. Don't go there thinking that we know better because someone who can speak three or four different languages 
is, is can't speak English the same way we can. My competency in English doesn't make, mean I'm intelligent. It just means I'm competent in English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I don't know, Les Lester, Aisha, did you want to contribute or? Hmm? Um, I, I just, I can see loads of questions, so I don't, I won't really say much, but I would just say just to, to add to that, think about the politics of travel. If you're going on a holiday, think about who you're paying to get there, mm. what you're going to do there, how you're being there is going to affect the other people who live there. Mm. I think that's really important as well. Okay, so raise your hands if you have questions. <laughs> okay, uh, so you have one, two, three. Let's start three at a time, and then we'll follow. Um, Abdul, first. One, two, one. Two. Uh, it's been a great the panelists of really presented some uh, interesting points. Um, but I feel that everything I've heard is all in the problem mode and an analysis of the problem. So you have great understanding of the problem. And people can talk for hours and hours and hours of the problems this and all these problems. But solution mode, you find people go quiet when you ask them to suggest a solution to the problems you've been talking about and analyzing so effectively. So, power. I'd like to know from each of the panels on the issue of power, what is the best identity to effectively organize the black diaspora in order to counter the power of white supremacy? What is the solution? What is your solution? I'm going to jump in on that. Um because I respectfully push back. I think that we have been um, talking about solutions. I feel like one of the solutions in my part anyway is, for instance, the children's home. One of my solutions is the book. Um, one thing that I can take overall of many things, for instance, that um, uh, Toyin said, you know, that's been sharing with us. Um, you mentioned about accessibility and so when you ask Mikhail about why do we use so many different forms of media to to express the ways that we think it's because if we're talking about not leaving anybody behind everybody needs to be able to access the information so Usman Semben when he moved from books to films is because if I'm going to reach you in the films and makes it more easier for you to imagine with me then I'm going to go that way we can't sometimes I think that even when we start talking in a in a problem and solution force binary or dichotomy we we limit ourselves sometimes we are talking about the problem and the solution all at once right because we first have to know what is making us ill in order for us to be able to heal it we have to be able to name it and of course that doesn't mean that we just stay with the um malaise we we start looking at the ways that we will be able to heal ourselves research that's been done by people like Aisha makes all of the difference because again we do need the stats so how are we going to go up against a power that has more stats than we do and we don't know um what we're working with um having for instance newspapers for instance that that allow for people to read about their immediate experience in the way that arguably the voice has done throughout the years is also part of um you know these solutions i i think that uh, you know, that they're um i think that Hopefully we are moving towards solutions. We're not going to have a hard and fast because again, like this is not a sprint. I think that sometimes in our ego state um, and our ego is moving uh, and speaking more loudly than our soul, our soul is eternal, divine. When the ego state is speaking, the ego state instead of dying, it feels dying. And so it talks about time. Time isn't really in that way. It's about time. So now saying solution, 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 like it's our ego dreaming because the immediate understanding and letting our soul come forth and our soul, this is a long journey, whether you like it or not, you might not even be, you might see this, but you sure as hell do as much as you can to um, awaken as full as you can, the work can get done. I do feel like many grassroots organizations, many as individuals that are doing the 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 if we're if we're trying very very pedantic is community 
So until we can come together in various and, and see each other, we actually can't move forward the problem. And so what we here is a community. Um, part of the problem, as you mentioned, um, and I'll just stop going on. Um, part of the question, um, part of the question that you mentioned about this um, problem thing is the fact that we said that it's um, spiritual work, warfare. We said that it's psychological warfare. We are, if we're talking about quantum physics or whatever we're talking about, we, all of us in this room have our own individual reality that's taking place right now. We're all looking at this, this stage, we're all of us looking at each other from different perspectives. But so there's our individual reality and then there's also our collective reality. We can agree that we are all in this room right now, right? Then we think about it on a macrocosmic scale that when we're talking about white supremacy, when we're talking about this racist society that we're na navigating, we are in somebody else's reality or another, you know, groups of people. For This reality has been created over centuries. So when we talk about imagination, we're not focusing on the problem. We're focusing on the solution because if we can all collectively start imagining a new reality, we can inhabit that reality. So that in a long-winded way, I feel like we were talking about the solution. <laughs> <laughs> are we gonna have some questions from this side as well yes let's uh yeah i think you answered it <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> okay. and uh speaking of ego please allow your ego to keep it very short it's thank you criticize no, not for you yes? not for you <laughs> the question the question yeah no monologues right <laughs> criticize our <I> bagel <laughs> Uh, um, right. Thank you very much for everything that you've said. Um, I grew up in Sierra Leone. All of my siblings look a lot more like you and you, and then I'm in the middle with this going on. Um, and there was one other girl in my whole school who also had this, but everybody else in her family <laughs> didn't look like her. So it's um, you really see how... I'm going to say the word colorism, but for example, um, like we lived with various relatives, sometimes you have to go and get water. People would come running up to me and say, you shouldn't be carrying the water. But my younger sister, smaller, younger, was all right for her. So that's just a, a memory. And um, I like what you said about, I'm going to go over various things, like what you said about trade unions, they've never, ever supported me in anything. I still pay the dues. But yeah, well, I, um, I wanted to, um, this thing about culture and how cultures are constructed. Um, in our language, we don't have gendered pronouns, do we? We say we tell and say eagle goody. You know, we never use. But at the same time, when we're being educated, there's all these massive fights about in English about pronouns and but but what this kind of the the way it's becoming normal to you to fight on behalf of this thing that actually isn't your culture. I mean, we were brought up going to school in in I'm older than her, but wool and felt hats and blazers and all, under African sun. Sorry, I'm just getting carried away because I wrote down so much and I know I don't have a lot of time, so I'll try and get to the end. There is a question coming. There is a question coming. The question is, for a start, how do we get people to disengage with what has been driven into them over centuries? There are people who don't talk to me because I don't pray to a white Jesus. I can't look at where he was born. Please don't tell me he had blonde hair and blue eyes, but somehow I'm the bad one here. I mean, sorry. So the question is, how do we get people to disengage and not be scared of the disapproval that they're going to get when they do disengage? All right. We got there in the end. How do we get people to oh, I try engage? I try and be succinct, right? There, there's a, Sorry. I think there's there's a quote. I think it's Neely Fuller. No, it's not. It's not actually Tony Morrison actually mm -hmm. puts it far better. 
uh, it's about the, the, the it's about the role of white supremacy and racism. It serves to distract us. It just and nearly further he talks about it confusing us. And so what happens is that we get engaged in distraction politics, and that's because we're humans and we care. As a Pan Africanist, I have to care about sexuality issues and pronouns because our community has people who are queer. If I, if I look at the history of James Baldwin, my favourite uh, diasporic movement was the Black Panther movement, but they roughed him up badly, right? And so as much as I love both of them, it's like they've roughed him up badly. So I think you open up with this beautiful quote, if, if, you know, if everyone can't come, then I'm not coming, something around that line. So we have to understand that. But the point you're making about distraction is very key. And so I think this is where the nerdy part comes in. You have to know what's your thing, what's your baby, what's your what's your specialism, what's your point, and then be committed to it and not feel not homo and think that what's just happening over there. I need to jump into the over there. Have an interest in those things, but you you do your work on that area. That's the trick. What happens is that we and that's most that's where most diaspora are right now. It's like you know, I the whole research was identification of protest. And it's because what's that we've moved away from activism into what I call activism, where what happens is that we make a campaign, right thing right now, and then three months later we get bored. And it's kind of like this, uh, what you call it, like these buffets where you pick a different campaign every three months, and then you drop that thing without having solved it, and you move on to the next thing. As African people, we can't deal with that, or what's nothing gets fixed. So you can have an interest in other things, but the distraction politics is not for us. So, I mean, that's, that's what I can give you on that. It's discipline. It comes down to discipline. All right. Do we want one from that side? And then we'll come back to this side. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for everything you shared with us today. I'm going to try and keep my question. As short I've got faith in you, brother. Put to size, yeah? As short as possible. So I want to hone in on the point Toyin made about self-love. Because um, I think it's a shame that um, Aisha shared a lot about how um, Black students make um, jokes about like skin color and stuff like that. But I think it's a shame that if you look at the situation um, in detail, you'll see that the same thing does happen on the African continent. And in the same way, it happens in the UK, but also in a different way in the sense that I'm sure if there's anyone here who went to school or grew up in um, a country in maybe perhaps West Africa, like Ghana or Nigeria, you would see that um, there are some little things such as um, hair growth. You know, you go to school and then you're told you can't grow your hair past a certain level. Um, and I think that's almost a reflection of what Toyin was saying, whether do we even love ourselves? It's almost as if in the education system, they're trying to mold you into being um, as, an, as an African as possible. And it's also reflected in the fact that there are some schools in Ghana whereby when you speak the native language, you're told don't use this language on, on campus. And I think that's a reflection of the lack of self-love even at home. So the question I want to ask you is that, do you think there's a direct link between the fact that there's no love at home? The fact that there's no love at home has had an effect on, you know, the black people who have left home and are, you know, in the diaspora. Or do you think, thank and, you, brother? Yeah, and what do you think? Appreciate you, man. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you so much. You tried, you tried. <laughs> and what what do you think can be done to? Hey, you that's two. You up. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah, can I just uh, push back on that um, slightly? Because I, I think that uh, you know I, I totally agree with everything that has been said about about love and about about self hate. But, but there's also fear as well uh, that actually I think that a lot of people, you know, are through through this, you know, systemic racist system that we have actually do love themselves, um, actually, you know, don't hate themselves, but are but are fearful of, of, of organizing, uh, of you know, organizing just simply by by association uh, with other black folk, really. Uh, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that we need to push back on. So, yeah, we, and we absolutely do need to push, you know, uh, you know, promote uh, black love. But I think that. You know, the, you know, if you look at, you know, I know we talked about workplaces earlier, um, you know, that's such an oppressive um, environment for, for for many, in fact, most black people. Do you know what I mean? It's like the, the hairstyles you talk about in relation to um, school, um, that also <laughs> applies at work too. This 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 is the system that we're dealing with. So, we, we you know, we have to dismantle it, you know, brick by brick um, and, and recognise the fear 
within us uh, as well in order to actually deal with that. Because if you don't recognise it, then, then it's difficult to, to to deal with it. Can Can I also jump in yeah. on, on that one? So I think um, it's really important what you're talking about, love at home or the lack of it. And in our research with, with young people and also our research with adults as well who've been affected by colorism, you've got things like parents saying to one, one young woman, you're black and ugly like your grandmother. You know, things like that. If your parents see you as a problem, if your parents see you as ugly and instill in you the sense that you're ugly from when you're really young, that will have an impact on everything. You'll take that with you. One That same woman said, will I ever be 100%? She was in her 50s, I think. Will I ever be 100% satisfied with my skin shade? I don't know. And it took her so long to even see herself as anything other than this ugly person that her father said she was mm -hmm. and then if you think about then who that means you can love we had participants saying you know I want someone who's got light skin and even in we got them to make memojis the students make memojis of what they look like what they think looks attractive and so many of them the attractive person was someone who could be mixed or has very light skin really loose curls just it's it like the dolls test again in some ways um, and it's just if you don't have an intervention where we can work with parents and help parents to understand what they what their role is and the damage that they can do to young people if they perpetuate colorism, and if we don't have an intervention where you can work with very young people, like primary school age, I think, to help them understand that they're beautiful and, and that we shouldn't be judging people based upon skin shade, it's going to be very hard to make a, a, um, a powerful intervention because otherwise you then get into adulthood and you're like, well, I'll choose that partner because she happens to be mixed race. She's better than the ugly black woman. You know, these things then get perpetuated and, and I think it's really problematic. I think there's a workshop in there actually. Yeah. Can, can I, really good idea. Very quickly. Go ahead, go ahead. Really quickly. Just to add on to that as well, is it's, it's also recognizing that when we're talking about the media, a lot of our children are actually not taught by us. They spend most of the times in school. And if they're not in schools, in my generation, my, my babies, I mean, not my children, but they, a lot of the children around them were taught by CBBs. They were taught by the tweenies. They were taught by the media. So what happens is that they have this distorted idea, which is actually produced by white supremacist systems, which, them, you know, it tried to be this colorblind route. They often have animals and stuff. But if we're not visible, then we never know we're beautiful. And so, you know, I remember with my children, as much as they've learned about their history, I used to show them things like Chico and Rita. It's an amazing animation. I'd show them things. You know, if you haven't seen, um, what's it, Queen and Slim? You know, you have to show media, film, poetry, songs, you know, all these kind of different media where we win, where we're beautiful, where we're normal. We don't even have to have superpowers. We just need to love ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's part of the solution with this particular issue. Sorry, brother. That's part of the solution as well. If we don't see that, if we always see ourselves in conflict, always trying to escape from who we are and what we are, then that's what we, you know, that fear that Lester talks about is, is becomes very real because we always fear that if we show ourselves, you know, and our true self, and that's what love really is, right? Love is about exposing yourself naked to the world and being accepted. And it puts you in a very vulnerable position. So a lot of people are frightened to do that. And so if we can't do that because we can't see it actually accepted anywhere else, then we get into this kind of like this really close space. And then we become receptive to all the violence and to all the anger and to the self-hatred. We, we cultivate because deep down we do love ourselves. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, no, you don't have to stand up. And you understand? If I give you this mic, yeah? Can I trust you? All right. I, I, I stand up because I think it's important for everyone to connect with us. My name is Amma. I always in introduce myself. I'd actually ask everybody who speaks after me to introduce yourselves, just your name, so we connect with each other. Okay? So, <laughs> hi. Um, I'm going to make... Where's, where's Nigel disappeared? I'm going to make... A couple of contributions, and then I'll ask the question. The contributions I want to make is, this week, we are here on the backs of others who came before us. It's important for us to remember that. Our parents, our families, and I'm going to highlight two people because they're connected to the institution we're in. This week, on the 9th of April, it was the anniversary of the birth of Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson studied here. In March, it was the anniversary of the birth of Walter Rodney. Walter Rodney studied here. If you don't know anything about anyone else, study those two people. They were activist scholars. They were part of the solution which has got 
all of us here into this room. So when we are talking about solutions, let us remember everybody who went before us, including our families who have sacrificed so some of us can sit in these rooms, some in our families who've never sat in rooms like this. So my question to the panel is, outside of this room, even within this campus, there are Africans. Africans who are working as security, Africans who are working as cleaners, Africans who are working in catering. First of all, my challenge to everybody in this room is wherever you move around in, talk to the ordinary Africans, the working Africans, because they are a part of the solution and also they are the beneficiaries. And my question to the panel is, how do we carry on the conversation outside of this room? And my question to the organisers is, how do we involve those outside of the room and in particular outside of academia? Because one of the things I would love to see, Nigel, is one of these days to have one of those ordinary Africans, as I call them, maybe not the best phrase, sitting up there on the panel. Thank you. Okay, I'll take the as one of the organizers. For you, Mikhail. And, and for you too, Nigel. Welcome. <laughs> um, Up to my school, that's my answer. I mean, I think the answer is uh, a little bit what you said at the beginning, earlier on, around community, right? Community is the key of everything. It, does, it doesn't happen only in those rooms, it happens everywhere. And when we even when we were thinking about who to invite, uh, you know, for the panel, what kind of conversations we wanted to have, I think we wanted to be specific about not including only acad academics, but you will see that within the panel, like even for you, Toyin, we spoke uh, earlier around this, most of your career, it was actually a grassroots organizing, right? And so absolutely important to have this conversation with each other. This is what we're here for, and this is also what we're trying to do with the Center, uh, Center of Pan-African Studies here at SOAS. And yeah, conversation happens everywhere. It's in community, right? I don't know, Nigel, if you have. I would not put it, could have put it better myself. It's just we need participation, that's all. Because the communities are there, I feel like, there are pockets and silos, but perhaps we need to do a better job as leaders of those communities in knitting everyone together. Um, but for sure, the School of Pan-African Thought is one, and you are all welcome, panafricanthought.com. Thank you. And I think that if we are so sure that we want people in the room, we have every um, um, ability ourselves to invite them. Like, we all know people. Like, we don't exist um, in isolation. So... Thank you, Elder. I feel like also bring some, right? Well, right. So bring bring someone, bring someone along with you as well next time. Like, you know, people's working patterns, but definitely bring people along with you. You know, all of us that are here, aunties, uncles, brothers, sisters, bring them along. All right. This is what we're going to do because of time. Yeah, we're going to take two questions from that side. Then I'm going to take two questions from this side. Yeah. And they they are questions. Yeah. No preamble, no monologue. Just questions, okay? Abdul? Yes. Questions, questions, yes? Otherwise, pat the mic. <laughs> um, my name's De Devante. Um, just a quick question. Um, you've probably seen like there's been like a rise in, um, you know, like pushback against like DEI and like anti workness and all of that stuff. I just wanted to know if it's affected you guys like, in the organisations that you work in. That's it. And who's the second the lady behind you, Abdul? Because I'm so shy. Um, I just have uh, Lasta. Oh, Millie. Lasta, you mentioned reparations earlier, and I was just wondering what you think that looks like and who would be entitled to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I mean, it's not for me to say. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the 
the campaigning that um, I think a lot of people in reparations do is, is recognise that you know not not everyone sees eye to eye. You know, within uh, you know the uh, Pan African uh, movement, there's there's lots of different views about what reparations uh, is. Um, but what's undeniable is uh, is the cost of it um, and and the benefit as well in terms of who's who's benefited. Uh, and uh, that's why I think the Brattle report was so so important because it kind of quantified both sides. Now, obviously, you can't put a price on life and you can't put a price, uh, you know, on 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 millions of lives. But uh, but at least you can actually um, say the, this is this is the debt uh, that is uh, this is the minimum that is that is owed um, and then have a conversation about how that's going to be um, paid. So I think that's that's really important to uh, to do. Uh, just on, on the point that the, the one uh, made about uh, the DEI, um, I, I work in uh Cambridge University at the moment, and um, the, uh, you know, I uh, my boss is Lord Simon Woolley, uh, who worked for many, many years uh, in Operation Black Vote, um, and the work that he was involved in, which, you know, I kind of helped him from time to time uh, in that, was actually about getting uh, black political representatives uh, in Parliament. Um, and, you know, I think it's, you know, if, if Simon was here, he would say for himself, it's, it's a matter of regret that some of those that have actually, you know, got, got into Parliament are the likes of, you know, Kemi Badenoch, um, you know, are the likes of, you know, uh, James James Cleverly, are the likes of, you know, um, you know, Priti Patel, Suella Bravman, and so on. Um, so, um, you know, he's now moved to a place where, uh, as an I- I- educational institution, uh, it's about it's saying to uh, a, a making the, the place much more you know diverse, but at the same time um, actually saying you know with your world class degree uh, you know feel um, confident to actually go out and change the world for the better uh, because you know too many people go through Oxbridge uh, and they just go into uh, you know the city and just just earn uh, earn a pile of money uh, and so the the, the mission that, uh, that that he's doing and I'll get to the point of it in two seconds uh, is uh, is to actually say this is a place where you, where you belong uh, because this is not some kind of you know alien institution you know this is that this is the, the you know institutions that were, that, that um, you know were, were, were built on enslavement of Africans this is uh, you know what what is uh, owed to you uh, and you belong here and and you should feel confident to express yourself um and change go out and change uh, go out and change the world now the pushback that we sometimes get from the, you know the sort of liberal world um out there in places like uh, you know oxford and, and cambridge uh is is one which gives lip service uh to uh to to dei if you want to call it that uh but there's pushback and uh, you know, whenever where there's anything meaningful uh, that actually matters, uh, that you know, if it's something which is free and is unlikely to to change the system, uh, then they're absolutely fine with that. Uh, but you know, a- a- anything more radical uh, than than a, that there's there's a problem. And I think it's important to um, point that out uh, because you know it's so subtle that you know the pushback is not just about the. Uh, you know, blaring um, anti woke um, agenda that you you know hear and read about in the Daily Mail. Uh, it's also very subtle from people who pretend uh, that they are actually our, our allies, uh, and and they're really not. And it's about calling calling that out, which itself brings battles. But you know, we've got to be up for those battles. Amazing point. Uh... Oh, well, you look you look looking at me with daggers. All right, so I know you. Brother, question. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, lovely contribution for everyone. Uh, my name is Gurma. I, I do have a little introduction. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Um, quickly, though, um, it's still on this basis of solution. Um, and I appreciate very much that everyone here is contributing to the solution. But I'm thinking along the lines of this imagination that um, we're we're um, being told to adopt, and I'm imagining that um, the forces that we are arrayed against um, are, are very much centralized, even though they come in disparate regions in different disparate forms. So I'm thinking along the lines that um, <clears throat> with the history of Pan Africanism, it seems like every time it changes shape or form there is something that it reacts to. Say, for instance, the first Pan-African conference was um, in reaction to that scramble for Africa, the initial one. Um, In this time, we have um, 
transhumanism, as you say, re reparations. I mean, what could be that coalescing thing that um, gets Pan-Africanism to look like it existed before? And within that context, is there space for some form of centralized um, action, quote unquote, task force committee to, you know, secret societies, to whatever not, whatever is, you know, yeah. Good question. Very good. That's that. That's a tricky one to answer in a public space. Um, <laughs> and, it's re and it's recorded. Just a second. Yeah, we'll then you answer that. Okay. Thank you, everybody. My name is Wendy Moligua. Uh, I'm a Kenyan born African woman, and I'm proud of it. I've got my daughter there. So, my quest, my answer to you, my sister. Experts by experience, bring them along. We are the experts. Mm -hmm. Bring them to experience this. I came to UK 30 years ago. She was five years. She was your age. Now, every time I ask, she says she's an African, but she cannot speak the language, which I'm ashamed of. But that's done. But what is paining me most is 50 years, over 50 years ago, Marcus Garvey, Nkrumah, Du Bois and so forth fought for this. Where did we get lost? Where did mm. we stop it? Now, I'm proud of you. You are still lighting that card for them. That one. <laughs> and the issue of language, the, I will explain how it happened. Being an immigrant woman, with a career, I came to work for a bank here. I had three of them. I had to work, I had to look after them. I could not leave one of them to go downstairs to take the bill. Something in Africa that never was a problem. So we cannot be so harsh on our African parents who were who came to England without an understanding or Europe without an understanding of the culture here. I I didn't know how to make hair because all I could go, go to your auntie, she'll make your hair. So many little challenges that held us. I have to take their, his, her sisters to boarding school, whatever, but that is not the point. We are here. We have identified there's a, pro, there's a break, not a problem. There's a disengagement. Mm -hmm. Let us continue. About the identities, right now I'm trying to write something for the head council on dementia. Do you know again, I cannot get a black population? Do you want to tell me our old people don't have dementia or if they do, why are they go? Or where are our people to contribute to that, to discuss the way you guys were discussing you? I'm not finished. I'm not asking. <laughs> I'm not asking a question. I'm making, I'm contributing to the conversation because all the questions that have been asked there. We have 15 there, minutes left though. Okay, yeah, 20. <laughs> Can I remind you in Africa, we don't have time. <laughs> But I, I never have this opportunity. I never have this opportunity open. We're in a university. But all I can tell you, our identity is under threat, not just here. When I go back to Kenya, and let me tell you, Governor Kiongo, I can walk to his to his home. We come from the same place. The river between is still cracked. We've got to cross that hill. We've got to break to build the bridge. The identity, our identity is being stolen, not just here. When I go back to Kenya, everybody is aspiring to speak in English. Everybody is aspiring to Nike. In fact, we are still telling our kids back at home, leave alone here, not to speak in our vernacular. The history they are taught is about England. The geography they are taught is about England. Knowing that how beautiful Kenya is, it pains me. But mm. the thing is, this is not us alone. We have to join hands with the continent. We can't disassociate ourselves as these are their, their scholarly people. We belong to one mother, and that's Mother Africa. Right. And we have to keep fighting. I didn't have a question. <laughs> 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 Big up. Big up. Mom's here. I wanted to say, um, we as children, wanted to fit in and that's something that should be mentioned. Thank you. Hey, panel, please. That's going to be a hard one. <laughs> so, so, okay, so the language thing I, I get, um, I mean, my Europe is awful. 
because my father's most like most who come over he, he, what our parents suffered from was what I call survival fatigue. And this is the whole idea is that, you, you know, just about not having rest, not having space, you're working two jobs. He was a BT engineer. He was also going to college. He was also doing the homework with us. Survival fatigue means that you deprioritize the learning of a mother tongue. And then, of course, the colonial construct, the education system has been set by the British, by the French, means that there's a, a de the depreciation of our languages in, in the motherland because they don't have it. They're not seen to have a commercial value. Because, of course, if you speak English, then you can actually leave or you can get jobs as interpreters, let alone the colorism, which happens if you're in West Africa. I know in the Caribbean, certainly if you go to banks, if you go to any government building, you'll see where colorism takes place. And that is accompanied by linguistic competence. So that's a complex issue. Wrapping it up on, on there. The reparations issue is another one as well. And this is a, and it's, it's a very good one as well. Lester was right. There are many ideas, uh, schools of thought when it comes to reparations. I believe in self-reparations before looking for reparations. That's my personal position, which means that we heal ourselves first before we're ready to go to anyone else and say justice. I don't believe the comp... I think we mix up reparations with compensation. But also Lester's been very humble. But one of the things that Lester did, you know, you might not know, he was also the editor before The Voice of The New Nation. And, and, and therein lies the solution. When I was like a roadman, as you call, not, I mean, not in the worst sense, but I was a bit of a ragamuffin at times. I get it. I, I, I look, I had a temper, I had a baseball bat in a car. I get it, right? <laughs> it's a journey, right? It's a, it's... <laughs> no, 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 we're friends. It's, it's a journey. You learn, you grow, right? So what happened was that Lester had confidence in me, had faith in me. And what happened, I was doing a lot of activist work. I was roughing up institutions. I was roughing up the British government. I was roughing up media institutions. And I had a, a job working as a weekly columnist for the New Nation. So it was a little ragged muffin me writing a national column for the whole country, for our people in the whole country. I'm not going to go into the politics of why it folded, et cetera, like that. But what happened with, 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 with having an independent organisation run by someone who's a pan-Africanist and understood that vision and stood by you. And he had pressure. Show, right nowadays we're used to the idea of picking up a mobile phone and, fo and, and filming the police back in the day i would write my columns and say do it and everyone would be fighting against us they'd be coming into the office and talking to him politicians and saying what's that twin doing on that newspaper why has he got this weekly column on the side he's causing trouble now it's normal practice so the solution from a reparations point of view is that we need to have independent organization and this comes to the strategic issue you're asking about the central mission is a misnomer, yeah? It's, there, there's, there's, a, there's a fallacy in actually going against an in, like a well-resourced enemy, kind of like, you know what I mean? Like when you're just not ready for it. I, and I'm, this is why I'm always careful about the words I use. Having a central mission, which is shared through imagination, through story, through narratives, through dreams, through spiritual beliefs and practices is important because it means we don't need to be in the same space to unify. We're all connected without being in the same space. We all have different interpretations. But Pan-African was first and centre about loving herself and freedom, being liberation. That's what it was about. Every decade, every century, it had a slightly different twist, whether it's after the Haitian Revolution, whether it's after the Berlin Conference. There might be a different twist, a different focus. But it's essentially about loving self, building community, okay, and liberation. That's always got to be the mission, regardless of what it's called. Most people are Pan-Africanists from the African diaspora. They might not even use that word. It doesn't matter if they don't use that word. As long as they see another African person and they say, you know what? There's love there. There's something in there. And then there's other people who support Pan-Africanists who say, you know what? I hear where you're going. I see the pain. We saw that with the Black Lives Matter movement. In fact, the, the strength of the Black Lives Matter movement, even though it had this very American focus on it, was that it brought together a multi-ethnic group of people, young people, in a way I've not seen for decades. And that was amazing. So it's not really looking to find that one single doctrine. This has always been the mistake, trying to find that one mission that everybody's going to sign up to. They're not going to sign up for that. What people want is liberty and they want love. And when they have that, then everyone's going to organise and work in a different way. And this is why Sister Emma was so right about that social connections. If we don't even know each other's names, then we cannot meet each other. We can't see each other. And so we, 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 we dissipate into the wind. And then what happens until Nigel, you know, oh my God. <laughs> Mikhail, 
Now, sorry. Yes, it's I'm old age. <laughs> it's a very good point. Until until they reorganise and reconvene something, so we can come together again. What happens is that we start feeling isolated again. And the trick of white supremacy has always been to make us think that we're alone. That it's always going to be yeah. here. That it will never disappear. And historians, I'm not historians. History tells us very clearly. Every single empire in the history of humanity, when its decline comes, and it will fall, its decline comes, it's rapid. We don't see it coming. Yeah. So unless we have a vision, <laughs> unless, unless we have a vision for what we will do in that space, the danger is what I call the Guy Fawkes paradox, is that we will recreate the same oppressive system that is doing it. So we have to have a vision. That's why Octavia Butler is so important. You know, even Ursula Le Guin wrote for Anarchists. You have, that's why I love sci-fi. You have to have that vision. And, you know, and, and I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you. So we, we are moving to... Oh. Do you have people? Yes. All right. Okay. So your people and then my people to finish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good evening. My name's Hayden. I have a relatively short question, but I think the answer is going to be way too long. So, um, first of all, I'd like to address what Amma said about the importance of, um, I think Amma's term was quote unquote ordinary people, Africans. Was that right? Yeah, because, you know, to me personally, it wouldn't occur to me to not recognize those people in any space that I'm in. And I teach at UCL and not least because at UCL on more than one occasion, I've been mistaken for one of those quote unquote ordinary people by other people who teach alongside me. So I think I didn't need that lesson to see the, to see those people in the room anyway, because I come from those people. So why wouldn't I recognize those people? However, I feel that in this country, class has a very pernicious effect um, on a particular type of black people who feel that once they're co-opted <laughs> into, and I think we all know who we're talking about, and I think one of them in particular was mentioned this evening. But when I, there's this chasm as I see it that, you know, the academia creates between me and those other black people who are in that space, that above and beyond, you know, a fist bump and recognizing somebody and knowing their name and talking to them like I would if they were a family member, how do we get them into these spaces? Because they'll also tell you that they're working ridiculous, you know, timetables. They're not working the kind of hours that I work or in the way in which I work. Right. I'm not teaching at the moment, so I have yeah. a soft schedule. So how, what how do we do get we them do? into the spaces? What, what do we do? do we do to get them into these spaces and onto that panel? What what's the who have you got someone else? No. Okay, great. How do we get them in Twitter size response from our panel? Um, I think that it's such a I think it's thank you. I think it is, of course, it's a valid question, but the reason I feel like the first time I was, you know, the, the iteration of the question, to me, it sounded like what happens when um, white people are on a panel discussing racism and they go, oh, so how do we just get the blacks inside? Like, how do we get them in here? And it's like, but no, because we 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 are already around people that everyday Africans or ordinary, we're, we're already around them. So it's asking people what would make it easier for you to be in these environments like we go to people as opposed to expecting them to come to us you know um we we can have conversations if we are if we can say hi we can also you know find out about them and okay you can't make this but what would work for you and we work around we work around everyone but i have an idea in my head about the structures that we already kind of people will for instance not um they'll prioritize church maybe Right. A lot of people might prioritize church, might prioritize certain other things. And so it's do we do something? Is it an event that you do at a church? Will the church allow you to do these events? Like we go back into community because it, we do approach. We can. It is possible for us to approach things yeah. from a rather classist perspective. Yeah. OK. Can, can I, sorry, really quickly, I was going to make a similar oh, point, why these spaces, but really quickly thinking about also one of the other divides is around not recognising people of particular classes as black anyway. So, mm. I mean, it was um, Kwasi Kwarteng who was described as one of the coconut cabinet, but there's always been this thing about middle class black people being seen as not black enough, as coconuts, as bounties, whatever, whitewashed. All the students I was interviewing, there was a lot of talk about this whitewashed black people. And I think that's also problematic because you've got to recognise that there's many different ways of being black. And that is something that there's often a struggle with 
But is is Kwasi Kwarteng a great example? No, when no, he was no, on no, GB no, no. I must say, I must say my point, Nigel. When he was on GB News and he called me jackass of the week. So if there are coconuts abound, then I'm sorry, he might be one of them. And I know it's recorded. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be the last round now, yeah? Because um, we got to go, I'm sure. Yeah. It's a shame we're not in the village system. But uh, yeah, very quickly. Thank you. Um, thank you to the panellists. My name is Onola. And um, I wanted to ask a question that kind of revisits the sort of topic um, beyond the single narrative. So I, I've, I've recently just completed an MA and that MA was in Global Black Studies. And I submitted my dissertation on um, the power of Black, sorry, the value of Black mainstream social justice protest. And I, and I specifically um, put it in that way because I recognise that um, our protests have actually been co-opted. Mm, yeah. So my question to the panel, bearing in mind that it's um, beyond a single narrative, is to just try and understand what protest should look like within our community and just to try and encourage um, everyone in attendance and those who get to access this outside of this space to rethink and, and just sort of reimagine what protest could look like. I think that's very, very critical because the way that activism is now, unfortunately, has actually been, again, just used by the culture industry to become something completely different to what it has stood for in times past. So, um, that's my that's my question, and and I'd be grateful if you could all answer it in order to reach those who aren't in this space as well. We've got a question. How, how do we access that uh, paper? Is it published? Okay. <laughs> there's a question here. There's as a well. question here, but there's some that gentleman in the hat. Did you, you want to? No, hold on. I'm moderating this. Hold on. I know what I'm doing. Forgot about it. No, I'm here. Not forget. Listen, I have some manners in here. No, 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 no. No, I know what I'm doing. So. Uncle had his hand up from the beginning of the Q and A. Yeah, so let's get that straight. And then I'm gonna go to sis, and then you, and then I'm really sorry. No, 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 no. I'm really sorry. Other people took the time, and we do have to leave on time. Yeah. So, Uncle. Thank you very much. My, my name is Joseph Oladushu. Um, yeah. I, I just want to know we. There are some uh, hallmarks that in Pan-Africanism we have missed. In 1963, uh, Kwame Nkrumah made a very strong case in Cairo for Pan-Africanism. The gradual is one. We're just here today talking about uh, language. In first tax 77, I was one of those who collated the colloquium papers where uh, uh, a continental language was uh, recommended. Is buried, is dead and buried. Um, I, I was here last about 15, 20 years ago doing the same exercise as the director of ARI, Africa Research and Information Bureau. Uh, can't we try and uh, maybe kind of uh, I'm, I'm just thinking of the right word to use, uh, so that we can begin to achieve some concrete result because neocolonialism is, is, is a very strong institution and it has 54 neocolonial plantations on our continent. I don't call them countries, I call them neocolonial plantations. How do we do something to dismantle this plantations and create a continent for ourselves. And we, if you, okay, okay, so we have yeah. protest, plantations, and <laughs> positive action, collective action, and your question was, was it your turn? That's okay. All right, we'll just do two, and then the last two. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. So, yeah, so the question of protest. Okay, if, you, if I can play with the order, I'll go with the last one first. Um, Thank you, Uncle. Uh, 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 that's that's important what you just said and building on the legacy of, of where we come from. Uh, I'm an incumerist as well, and uh, I support much of the work that's done there. But I, I love Sankara for the African leaders of that generation. It's my favourite. 
Um, one of the one of the problems, however, with the people that are my role models, my spiritual role models, the Sankaras, the Lumumbas of this world, what happened was that even though they sold their, their vision to a select amount of Pan-Africanists, they didn't land with everyone. The first role of a Pan-Africanist is an educational role. It's actually sharing. I talked about that imaginary. It's sharing that mission first before you start engaging in action. Or oh, so what happens, like Festac was an amazing festival. Okay, the whole idea was, right, I'm a fellow man, right? So this whole idea about different nations coming together, the whole idea about the language is, is a perfect language. Why didn't it work? What are the practicalities of having African nations actually using one nigga franco? Do you use uh, Kiswahili? Do you, you know, do you use, what, what language do you use? Starts bringing in problems. So, so no. So, so no, so all, it, this, this becomes a tricky situation, and so people rely on the colonial. So it comes down to practicality. So the first thing I'll say on that is that why what you're saying is right, and we must never lose sight and go backwards from that. It, we must also, at the same time, simultaneously remember that we are now talking to the next generation that have not. It's not enough just that they've survived, which is actually a miracle in itself. You have a whole world that's trying to exterminate you, mm -hmm. but they also have new skills. They are not starting from the same position that we are starting from. The, the young people I deal with are far more conscientious, far more politically aware than I was when I was their age. I was bumming around you and making music. Nowadays, people are more aware of that. So it's just having that. I'm not saying, and I'm going to lead to the solution that you're talking about. I'm not saying that we don't we disrespect that, but I'm saying that if you know, if Sankara, for example, had sold that that message, which was an amazing message to everyone, each of those cases, our our leaders, our revolution leaders, whether it's been in the Caribbean, you know, you know, it's they've always been undone by other Africans. Okay, it's something that we can't avoid. And so we have to sell it first. Um, there's a question about how do we do this? And I've, I've written down, uh, how, how do we do these discussions and stuff and reach so, you know, ordinary people? And, and Sister Amma did say that wasn't the word, right choice of words. And, and, and you're right. Uh, Walter Rodney is the same example. You know, you gave the example of Walter Rodney. And um, Walter Rodney talked about groundings. He talked about grounds with our brothers, but it's the same thing. Groundings with our community. It, it's changing the format. And that would ultimately um, change the way that, you know, we have these, 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 these discussions. For example, because we're inside a university space, the restraints of time is pushing us to actually stop just when we're really... In any African circle, we are now ready to bring out the jollof and get into it, right? But we're in a university space. So what we've got to do now is just pack up and go. Okay, that's not a natural vibe for us. You're throwing shade at me. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Because there's, no, because, because there's a mixture. There's a, there's a need to have both. And so there's a need to, to lose the hierarchy which comes yeah. from having this and being circles and having food and actually reasoning on a level which is actually more social as well as intellectual. That's the way we do it, right? So that's that's another thing. Um, okay. Unola, thank you. Congratulations on, on the dissertation. Thank you. There you are. That's, that's, that's all, you know, on, on that form. Protest, that's probably the most important issue. My research was similar to yours. It was called Gentrification of Protest. And it was because I'm seeing protests being split up, co-opted. And now the elites have actually done an amazing job in rendering an activist into a simple form. You wear a T-shirt, you go on Twitter, you turn up at a march, you're an activist. Mm. That's complete nonsense. Mm. But that's what we are now told activism is. I mean, you might remember the Kylie Jenner Pepsi advert, mm. where she came up with a Coke tin or a Pepsi tin and like, you know, co-opted the whole Black Lives Matter movement. So that's gone, right? That is part of the activist tradition. That's part of the way of pushing back. But for a movement to really be engaged in protest, to be really be engaged in change, I've written down quickly three things. There must be a level of disruption. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't disrupt, it's just maintaining the status quo, right? So it's not enough just to challenge. There must be something that disrupts it. The second one is that there must be some level of transformation. So people who come into contact with what you're doing must feel somehow transformed. The systems must be transformed. The laws, must, something must change. So disruption, then transformation. And then the third thing I'll put down there is healing. There must be some way, and I say healing, in, I could have said reparation. There must be some way that what happens is that the problem doesn't occur. The people who are harmed have eradicated that violence. And to do that, we have to recognise that protest comes in so many different forms. So when I was doing my research, I was studying governmental forms of activism, which we don't assume exists, but it does. And you know how it works? Is that people inside, for example, a local authority, someone who rubber stamps, who gets the housing stock, you know, who's on the waiting list and stuff like that. They don't want to be called an activist. They'll lose their job. But sometimes they might see a, a case study. They might see someone who's got like children, they've been suffering, they've had a bad life, and they just push their name up the list. 
that's activism. They might, they don't need to scream and shout to the whole world that what I did was activism. They just do it. And that's the problem. The way that we've conceptualized activism or the way we've been taught to conceptualize it is, have you got a t-shirt? Have you got a couple of selfies? Did you go on the protest march? Have you done all that stuff? And if you can't show that you're an activist, therefore you are not an activist. Well, no, if you're truly sincere about this process, then actually it's about the change. It's about the disruption. It's about the healing. It's the eradication of violence. And that, for me, again, becomes an educational process. I'll leave it there. Beautiful. Okay. All right, you were nice to me in the beginning, so I'm gonna, I was. I'm going to give you the. I'm going to give you the last word. I'll try and be as quick as I can, but my name's Tali Miata Fendisher. Lovely to see everybody. Thank you so much to the panel. Um, also part of organising an African Diaspora Festival on the 6th of July, so I'd love all of you in here to come. And there will be gel off. There will be discussion about different languages, etc. So just to plug that as well. Um, I think I'm hoping it's a quick question, but we've talked about the dynamic nature of defining pan-Africanism, identity, identity project responding to identity that's almost projected onto you from how you're perceived by others so in light of that dynamic nature of even who is included when we talk about being an African how do we then what are the things that we can do and the enablers to allow us to arrive at a vision that we said is important for us to work towards that's thank you thank you who wants to take that to close Kalechi <laughs> I, I, I agree with you everything can change right so when you said about the dynamic nature of even Africanism or, or Africanness that can also start shifting around as well and um, you mentioned there um, as well Uncle about um, neocolonialism and how strong of a hold it's having and these new neocolonial entities um is it Dipo Falonin was talking about um, Africa is not a country? Um, and um, he talks about Nigeria being an amalgamation of different ethnic groups of people for the sake of commercialization. Like, so even when we sometimes romanticize the continent, we're forgetting the commercial aspect of it. So then when we're thinking about how we identify, what are we identifying with when in our most recent histories, all we know is to be severely in dramatically like extracted from so it comes back to really self-sovereignty the concept of all of this is self-sovereignty we have to come back to ourselves we're not enough to this whole it like we're trying to navigate it encourages things but not to feel so we have to really be ourselves and that means we see other people you asked um, um about and it was asked earlier about um protest what i've is, is that using revolutionary language, they're not revolutionary people. And where you're seeing it happen, suddenly it'll be bad. And you're like, oh. um, I also noticed something that I mentioned before that, um, and I'll be quick, Nigel, because I can be biased. Um, um, so um, I've noticed something where he comes out and they experience because of a face, you know, like, and when he talks about thing, it's because of the horrendous experience through of the housing sector, and then suddenly you're into this thing of now activist and now here deal and so i just, the way that some of us included were trying to the institute was trying to defang, defang you by off things and so um Tony was about person's quote about action and racism the real function of racism is destruction at the end of that let's be one more thing will always be one more thing and I found myself getting up in the one more thing like I'm coming off Twitter I don't know let me come back because I've got to say one more thing go and do the work you know it's so, so it got to the point where for me I was like the protest isn't necessarily an outward one it's a subversive one like Tony was saying like I, let me go and do my work but that first requires me to do the work with me so when Khalil Gibran was talking about if you're looking to decolonize this tyrant or to dethrone this tyrant you have to address the tyrant within yourself like dethrone the tyrant within yourself so how can we have any movement um that's solid and robust and can stand the test of time if the tyrannical entities that have been entrenched in, within our psyche we haven't actually addressed that so 
it's not so much about an external identity as opposed to an internal one. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our wonderful panelists, please show your appreciation. Wonderful discussion. One more point. Sorry, when, where can people find you? Find you and I was just gonna ask. Where yeah. are you? Yeah. People are ready to leave. Yes. <laughs> anyway, where can people find you? And uh, that, you're on uh, X, I believe. Your work, uh, Lester. Uh, yeah, me. Uh, yes, yeah, just Lester J Holloway on on X. And uh, Tony, where can people find you and find out more about legally? That's harder. I mean, I, I'm on social media, but I hate it, so I don't respond very well to it. Um, just drop me an email um, or contact, you know, and and I'll I'll come. I'll if, 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 you, if you're serious, I will come. If you're not serious, <laughs> but if it's Joloff, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Aisha? So my details are on the King's website, Aisha Phoenix, and also I'm on Twitter, at, or X, sorry, yeah, King's College London. Um, it's at Firebird N4. And Kalechi? Yeah, I'm kind of on Kalechnikov, but I'm not there anymore. Um, um, I'm on my website, kalechnikov.com. There's a, a members area called Kaleidoscope now where I can share all my conspiracy theories. Thank you. <laughs> and where do we get your book? All outlets. Um, all outlets, yeah. It's there. All Thank right. you. <laughs> all right. And I also want to thank uh, Mikhail uh, Wildu, who's been a fantastic moderator. I'm sure you want to do that. Wonderful question. We were up all night thinking of them. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. And uh, guys, really, we appreciate you. This is just the start. As she said in the beginning, we have two more. Uh, those events will be informed by the questions and the feedback and everything that we've heard today. So we do hope to see you again. Bring a friend. And uh, let me get details of that festival so we can so we can all share it. Oh, I can share it with Share with you guys. So share with me and I'll share with you. I oh, see so you didn't say all that. Man. That's a, go on, go on. Oh, well, then that's a different story. But uh, love and light, everyone. Get home safe and we'll see you here next time. Good night. <laughs>